Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. So my, my name is Ido Pat, um, and right now I'm in the process of putting together my first feature film as a director and writer-director. And so I'm really interested in the subject matter of, of this panel um, because what we're going to talk about is a case study for how first-time feature filmmakers um, are able to put together a project. I guess the base, best place to start is uh, right at ground zero at square one. Mike, tell us about the origin of this project. Um, so, you know, a lot of films are financed by friends and family. That's the uh, low budget films. That's how, for, especially for first time filmmakers. And so these were just two, um, a uh, couple. Uh, Zach Coulter uh, is a um, pretty well known poet and comes from the literary world uh, and runs a literary website. And, uh, and, and his partner, uh, Magdalena Zizek uh, is somebody who uh, also had produced a film called Redlands and they were just big fans of a lot of my films and they came to me and said we want to make films like your films how can we do it and so I said to them the first thing is is that and they said we want to work with really talented actors and I said well it's tough to be to do that right out of the gate even if you have it and they said we have this little amount of money around 200,000 and it's I said it's hard uh, to get quality actors um, and so what you have to do first is make a short film to show that you can direct actors and so I helped them with that they made a short film and then they said what should the script be and I came up with an idea roughly I said based on the fact that there are a lot of great actresses tell me that they do not get enough roles for which they can play um, smart complicated people who both have sexual interest in young boys like why can't why does Ben Kingsley have to be the only male that can sleep with 25 year old girls it's like why can't we have a 50 year old woman who is a full human who has sexual interests had, can, can also be strong, can be confident, can be unabashedly intelligent, and not be apologetic. And I said, actresses tell me this all the time, that they get really frustrated that there's not enough roles for that. I said, if you write a role that's for that, we're going to have everybody in that time space, that age space, interested in this film. And that will start the process. And then from those actors, hopefully I can raise more money, replace your money, and find the money. And that's how it started. And then they wrote this script. Just sort of continuing the story, you started off with, with two poets. They've never made a movie before. They've got $200,000 to work with. How do you get from there to there? So the next step is, you know, a lot of time spent on the script. Um, they're um, obviously, you know, brilliant writers. So, you know, we were right away, and they, they're, they're big film fans. They're European film fans, not American film fans. And so we were in the space pretty quickly with the script. And, and then I had to convince um, casting directors. So as Gail spoke earlier, that's really the next step. And I go to casting directors who are respected by agents. And uh, in this case, I wor I worked, I've worked pretty closely with a uh, casting director, Susan Shopmaker, who is a highly respected, was Philip Seymour Hoffman's kind of go-to person, and only is uh, involved in quality. And I basically sent her the script, told her the situation, there's next to no money, and we want to get really the best actors involved. And uh, she read it and shared the passion. And the passion was that I think a, an actress will love this script. And she started to send it out, send it out, and they came to Lena Olin. And then she convinced the agent of Lena Olin, who's at Paradigm, that this was an amazing script and that she should like it. And then it went to Lena Olin with an, uh, a very low um, offer to, for payment. And she said that she wouldn't read it. She was insulted by how low it was. She works with Bergman, and she's a very high-quality actress. Why would she work for these pennies? And um, 
her husband, was Lasley Hallstrom, a director, looked at the offer letter and said, oh, the budget is 200000 That's a typo. It's probably a $2 million budget, so we'll negotiate the, the rate up. So let me read it. And he read it, said it was amazing, and then verbally read it to her. She agreed, and then he came back to the agent and said, it's great, we want to do it, but the offer has to go up since it's a $2 million film. And they said, no, it's 200000 And he, he said, it's not possible to make a movie for that. And the agent said, yes, it is, and Mike can make it happen, and it will be high quality, and convinced Lasley Hallstrom to do it. And she then talked with the directors and felt completely comfortable with them, and that's what started it. That's, that's amazing. So how did you get these guys involved in the project? So then, you know, it's a situation where we're doing a $200,000 film in where his, he wrote it also. So what did he do? He wrote for what I told him, which was this idea of an actress character that has this need and is intelligent. And then he, like all good indie films, said, what are my other assets? What assets do I have? His assets are an intense knowledge of poetry, a passion for poetry, and a beautiful house off the grids in Los Gatos in the mountains where his mother lives. And so he wrote for those assets. And so because it was low budget, I couldn't really be there full time. I had to start to bring other people in to start to wrangle all of that. And so I needed partners who also felt passion for the script, despite the fact that there was very little money. And that's where I went for it to Adam and to Morgan to say, can you help organize this and try to make this thing happen? So, and just to put just to put two hundred a two hundred thousand dollar budget in perspective, and this is this has been, you know, by the way, my my number one problem in uh, you know trying to adapt to the world of indie film as a director. Um, in my commercial production world, that's that's a typical budget for a one day shoot. You know, to I mean, you could get a, you could get a one day shoot and turn around a commercial and start and finish. A lot of those things are changing in the last couple of years, but, but that's a pretty typical one day project kind of budget. And we're talking about something that was going to have to shoot for how many days? Well, generally, you know, like what we did in Free Indeed here, usually in, when you're in that 200,000, 250 space, you're talking about three six day weeks generally. So it's 18 or 20. I think we did Junebug in 23. Most of these films are in that 20 day space. Right. So. So that's $200,000 include all the way through post-production, is that right? That's the idea, that's how it starts. Uh, uh, in the end, when we look at the budget, we'll see that in the end the film costs more, more like 350, but I raised all the money for post-production and um, we went up in budget, um, but that was, you know, we used that core amount of money and then we did go over budget, but I raised the rest of the money. Yeah. And, and out of that, the actors have to get paid too. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, when you talk to, did, did you talk to Lena directly, or you talked to the agent, or how did that, how did that work? Um, the agent knows me, and so I talk with the agent, and one of the things that I think that the agents know that's pretty consistent is despite how low the budget is, I understand that the top priority of actors who come and do these things is that they get to be able to make work that is not altered by the budget scenario. So they need to know that they're comfortable, they need to know that yes, I won't have a camper, but that I'm gonna do everything to manage production to the extent that those insanities of production don't affect the work. And that's also where I had to have partners like Adam and, and Morgan to ensure that, but the agents know that, from, I understand that the acting and the work is the most important, and that the whole production has to be structured around not having her wait around for her car at the end of a 12-hour day, that she has exclusive transpo, that she has a place where she's comfortable, that, that her wardrobe is protected, and that the crew is somewhat professional. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so you signed Lena Olin up, and then, and then did you talk to Adam? How, how, did, that, how did that come about? I think we were, uh, we were in Venice uh, with Free Indeed, and I started to talk to Adam about the situation uh, and then I needed a partner. There's a lot of, um, these films can't be produced by one person. There's a lot of 
things that have to go into a production. Um, at the time, we were also just casting the other roles. We got, Susan brought us in Rosanna Arquette, and then Jordan Javaris, who was in a TV show called um, um, Orphan, Black. Orphan Black. And so the cast started building, so there was a lot of energy. And I had to really focus on trying to raise more money. And so I needed a producers to come in to start to deal with the director on very logistical issues, because we were going to be shooting in a very remote area that was off the grid. And so the production aspects had to be start to be attended to by other professionals. Yeah. So Adam, what tell us about that your first encounter with the project? Well, um, in terms of what, you know, what what did you? Th I mean, Mike. Yeah. Came so to you, in you know, I, um, well, I said, what are you doing next? And um, you know. I was in California. I love California. Uh, I used to live in California. Um, I know where Los Gatos is. I go out there. Uh, my sister's about an hour away. I love the area. Um, he said, but it's completely impractical. I go, what do you mean? He says, it's up on a mountain, and there's no housing around, and it's a complete challenge. I tried to get them to move it, but they, they're committed to doing it in, in their mother's house. And... Um, and so I looked up Lena Olin, who I was a huge fan of. She's one of those rare actresses who you see her in something and you never forget it. Uh, unbearable Lightness of Being, and Romeo is Bleeding, and all the other stuff. And then I looked further and saw, you know, um, that she, you know, has a direct line to Ingemar Bergman. She was actually Miss Scandinavia, but then went to the, you know, the Royal Academy, and and had done theater with Bergman. So I had concerns, frankly, about first-time directors, but I, I had a complete, you know, that she would kind of be, the for, be, a, be a force that was gonna pull us through any difficulties, and along with Mike and Morgan, who is, you know, really kept the project together, coordinated it, and was doing all the hands-on work when Mike was, you know, but both together, but, um, and, um, and uh, so when I drove to the set, you know, I'm like, oh, no big deal. It's on a mountain with poor phone reception. My sister lives up on a mountain with poor phone reception with a bad road, you know, off the PCH. And Morgan goes, yeah, it's pretty hairy. You know, it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty scary drive. And I said, you know, no problem. I drove up there from town. It was like 45 minutes, 11 miles, two miles of unpaved roads. You know, the bottom of the car is bottoming out. Uh, you know, I have a, my GPS doesn't work, and uh, the sun is going down, and I was, you know, just keep going up the mountain, and I made the wrong left turn, and went up, and I was completely lost, and it was about to get dark, and I was terrified. Um, and so I got back down, and I don't remember, I think I got someone, or my, I was able to get a text through, and then I, I met, uh, Morgan, who had been up on the mountain for a while uh, with Magda and uh, Zach. And the, the director. That's Magda. how I arrived, you know, on this set. And I'm going, this is never going to work. Lena, Lena is not going to do this. You know, Rosanna Arquette is going to probably not do it either. So I was pretty terrified and filled with a lot of anxiety and fear. So that was, that was your role on the team, basically, was to <laughs> the conscience, let's say. And Morgan, how, how did you get involved? What, uh, how did it come about? Uh, I've, I've worked with both Adam and Mike before uh, on projects here in Memphis and uh, always jump at the opportunity to do so. And Mike called me up and like any good producer, told me a lot of lies to uh, convince me to do the project. Um, I mean, uh, that's, that's not true. But I mean, he, he had a, he had, he, so his pitch was, uh, you know, I would love for you to come uh, produced this movie with me in the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley uh, starring Lena Olin uh, near San Francisco and I'm like obviously yes I want to do that you know what he didn't tell me is that you know a lot of the crew hadn't been hired that it was completely off the grid that we use uh, you know it, uh, there's no cell reception and uh, no running water no housing set up for any of the crew uh, no electricity in a place that I had never worked before so, uh, you know, had he told me that all up front, 
you know, a good producer would never tell you that up front. Um, so, so he tricked me, and, and by the time I found out the truth, I was already up on the mountain and had committed and put everything else aside. So, so that was very smart of him. Uh, and then, yeah, I got up there, and, and uh, we just started grinding right away, and we had to figure out, uh, you know, I mean, the thing about the way this film was set up, and, and that you have, the way you have to shoot any film of this budget, is that it has the same tropes, you know, it's like, it's a minimal locations, it's all revolving around mainly one location, um, and, and not a huge cast, so it has all those things working with it. Uh, the biggest difference was that there was just challenges I personally had never dealt with before, like, like, figuring out that we were going to have to put the majority of the crew up in RVs on, a, on properties that we didn't actually own or have rights to, you know, and, and having to negotiate with neighbors whose first uh, way of dealing with you is with a shotgun, you know. So uh, it, it was that kind of negotiating that was a learning curve for me, but also very challenging and exciting, uh, being able to uh, start to figure out w what time at night the bobcats come out. Um, and the and the bears and the snakes, uh, you know, just figuring out all those kind of things, as well as just how how do you bring a crew um, on small rates? How do you convince them to be a part of a project, and then you know get people to understand there's an importance of of a community of people coming together to make good art, um, so that the things like the suffering of of long days and, and uh, living off the grid on the top of a mountain um, aren't the first thing that they're thinking of. That they're thinking about being with friends, other talented people, and making uh, art that they're proud of. Um, and so yeah, we just immediately started literally going door to door, negotiating housing, uh, figuring out where actors and um, as well as crew would stay. And then we got some like neighbors who would have like a, next, a spare room or, or whatever that might be and then the rest we like brought in RVs literally and like parked them on properties and people lived out of RVs for uh, several weeks to make this movie. Um, but a lot of that was already, you know, it was, it, it was a tight knit neighborhood up there. So a lot, of the, a lot of that groundwork had been done. I just came up there to help uh, push it forward and, and take some of the responsibility off of the directors and finish the work that, you know, Mike had already kind of put in motion. So when, when you, was there already a budget when you became uh, involved or did you guys put the budget together, you know, working together? How did that work out? I think I, I probably did a first draft, which is kind of a two hundred dollars to $250,000 template, which is like, you know, the one good thing about no budget is that it's very clear as to what you have and what you don't have, you know. Director's not getting paid, the writer's not getting paid. Um, there's going to be money put into both the actor salaries that's minimal but also support of them and then the minimal amount of crew and then the housing so it's pretty easy to to do that and I did that first and then the reality starts which is like okay we uh, gas is really expensive how does food going to get there you know all of those kinds of things and then from that fantasy concept that I did Morgan started to drill down into the reality, which is like, there's no crew in San Francisco that will work on in this film. Uh, in LA, it's really, really hard to get anybody in LA to deal with the idea of art or art film. Everybody just is like hustling for a gig, so it's really hard to get crew. And then you have to bring them up or fly them up or train them up and all those things. And Morgan got dug into that. So when you do, is there a visual that you want to show along with the with the budget or is it um... yeah I mean I think we can talk generally about yeah. budgets just yeah. to start with just so people understand um, yeah. I mean really any it can be a, a, a 20 million dollar movie or a, a two hundred thousand dollar movie you kind of you always put a prelim budget together you understand that you have X amount of money and you just you you summarize based upon your experience you know you say you need this for talent you need this for housing this for travel this for uh, whatever set support and locations, etc., and then and then none of that means anything until you actually start spending the money, and then that's when the budget just becomes malleable, and you transfer money from department to department based on your needs, and so that's that's what happened in this situation. We just had to start really uh, working within those constructs, um, and the, and the, and it changes every day, you know, multiple times a day, and so you have to constantly sort of stay uh, on top of all that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess we could put the, the budget top sheet. So, yeah. so the, just as you look at this budget, it just will show you how, you know, the money spreads. How does 230, how does $250,000 spread out? The whole time I, I was doing this, you know, we were doing this, I was simultaneously trying to raise more money. 
and also knowing that you know post production is the cheapest aspect you know we can do amazing color correct and sound like in New York City we can do amazing 5.0 sound mixing for like five or seven thousand dollars for like a four day mix and then we could get people to sound cut so the post production was always kind of like something that I you know wasn't too worried about it was really about getting it in the can and you know, when you look at things like what are locations cost, what is the crew cost, what is transportation cost, those are things that are really the real, those are the realities. And housing is a big, was a big issue on this film. And it kept going up and down really big. And transportation, for example, on like a $30 million film, um, the three lines that are the biggest costs are usually cast, production costs, like uh, set costs, and then transportation. Those are all, transpo sometimes is the most expensive line in a budget. And here we were trying to manage how to do it so that it would be l much less. Um, and so you just see how the money spreads in a very basic way in this budget. So, so Morgan, what was the key, just thinking about what Mike was saying, what was the key to making it work for so much less? Was it just, you know, the crew not, getting paid very much at all, if anything, or, you know, I'm not looking at the visual there, so you can... Yeah, and I have a, if anyone right. eventually has individual questions, I have it here as right. well. You may not see the full thing there, but we can discuss it. You know, I mean, you basically have a number that uh, is your max number, and then you start shifting things around once you have certain priorities, you know? And so, like, certain things like housing often aren't negotiable, you know, or they're negotiable, but once that's set, then you set that, and then if there's extra, you move that to a different department. Um, casting, obviously. I mean, one of the first things that was a huge challenge that I had not really dealt with before um, was some of the, most of the deals for actors were in place, and I knew that we could not spend more. Um, but agents will, you know, their job is to fight for their, their client, you know? And so, but I got, um, you know, one of the first things I had to do up there is like, finish these deals with the actors. You know, they had basically been negotiated, but there's the, fi the finer points. And I just knew that, you know, I was dealing with a couple agents that, like, you know, started screaming at me, essentially saying, you know, using the tactics that they do, they say, how dare you treat, you know, don't you want to treat them like a world class, you know, they use all the tactics thinking that there's some negotiating, and I just knew that there was no, like, we had no wiggle room, this wasn't a lie, this wasn't, we actually had 500 and we were trying to lowball everyone, and so I literally just, like, listened to an agent scream at me and just said, great, well, this is what we have, this, it is what it is. She hung up, uh, called me back three minutes later and said, great, hey, I really respect you, uh, I'm glad, you know, my, my uh, talent can't wait to work with you guys, the deal's been emailed to you. You know, it's like, so there's a lot of things like that uh, that you'll face with the smaller budgets that you just know, like, look, this is the reality and I can't, if I, if we, if I had somehow taken my liberty to like, give, you know, figure out 5,000 extra dollars in that scenario, then I'm losing it for housing, you know, we're losing it for cater, whatever else that you just can't. So you have to know where you can cut corners and where you cannot. Um, and I just think that that's something that you have to discuss with your team. What, what is, what are the real priorities there? In a situation like this, if you're off the grid, you have to feed your crew, you know, like X and three times a day or whatever that might be. You can't not do that. And so you can't cut corners there, you know, for example. Yeah, I mean, the whole process of, of dealing with the agents is the agents are trying to protect their clients. Sure. They want the, the worst, the nightmare of an agent is that they find out that they could have been more money put into uh, La Quinta versus uh, La Ghetto. And that hotel difference, if they find out that that difference went into some other perk or went to a salary of a director, they're going to be upset. And so part of the process is letting them know that we truly, sincerely don't have the money and we're trying to make the more and that the best with what we have. And then if they demand more, it will either take money from the screen, which means we have to cut a day, or we're going to recast them. And we have to, I was constantly dealing with the director. We had a couple that were very di difficult and I kept saying to the director, let's start looking at number two. I want to drop this person because they're not agreeing and they're giving Morgan a lot of trouble. And that's the only strength that you have is being able to recast. Now we had Lena and we had Rosanna and they were both on board and they knew what, they, what the reality was. Later it became 
a bigger problem, but at the time they were, I did their deals and they were fixed. Everybody else was trying to negotiate as much as possible and we were prepared to walk away on all of them. I'll just tell one story about Lena. Um, this is really a problem with her agent and not, not something we did, but um, knowing, knowing his client's uh, desires as far as housing, when, uh, one trick that I kind of played was, because I was really afraid about, about the film coming arriving to it, is that um, I, uh, there's no housing in the town of Los Gatos. There's, like, there's only expensive hotels and you know one or two Airbnbs. And I actually booked an Airbnb in pre-production and they're like, oh, you're staying there. That's where Lena's going to stay. And I looked at this place and I go, I feel like it's funky. There's no way. And so what I did to you, Morgan, was I made sure I was out of town when she arrived. <laughs> and I called him and I said, uh, how's it going? He goes, well, she pulled up and she said, no. Wouldn't even get out of the car. And I said, so what are you doing now? And I go, we've got her up in this fancy thing and we're trying to find other options. And um, so I apologize for that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I mean, so the other thing about, uh, you know, working in a $200,000 indie, it is very rare. I mean, I think you can with a real, you, you will never get a, uh, someone of Lena Olin's caliber uh, for 200 k unless the script is really good. There's just no, there's n the money, uh, the money means literally nothing to them at that point. It's only just like a, uh, a gesture, you know, and so, uh, but 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 what you do inherit when you get a star of her caliber for a movie like that is is that you have to step up in ways that you would not on normally on a two hundred thousand dollar film. Not that you would miss street actors ever, but just that there's expectations, and that and it's not that she's Lena was even being uh, difficult because she actually she was a really really pleasant to work with, incredibly pleasant. Super, super wonderful, and uh, but she just was. There was no way she was going to stay in the place that we had booked for her, when and that's she, because she. I mean, she's only had a certain level of uh, experience with that, and and that's the way she lives her life. Can't blame her for that, you know. So, yeah. you just have to understand uh, and prepare for that, and that's not what you would normally deal with on a budget of that size, you know. Yeah. yeah she told me that when uh, when she shot a film in Venice, they gave her a palazzo, and then when you go through the Stockholm airport, they're huge photos of the, uh, you know, of the gods of uh, Sweden culture, and they have, like, her husband, Lasse Hallström, huge, you know, 12-foot things, her, you know, Bjorn Borg, uh, ABBA, you know, so she's, that's what she's, where she comes from. But the most important thing, you know, which, you know, which Adam really helped with, which was that, Again, we have to prepare production so that the so that the nightmare of this micro budget production does not get in the way of the work. And if ever the actor feels in the middle of the process, why am I doing this if I don't have my makeup, if I don't have my hair is muscled, or if I don't I don't have a proper production that's capturing this. And so you're constantly trying to maintain the integrity of the production so that she doesn't feel that her, her performance is being hurt. And the number one thing is that if she wraps at 10 p.m., she goes into makeup and hair and wardrobe, even though we had one 15-passenger van for both the crew and all the cast, she would not be waiting for a second. And she would step out of the chair after her makeup was taken off, and she stepped into a clean car and was immediately whisked down to her meal and to her comfort so that she could start to prepare, because she's an intense preparer. And that was something that was the most important thing that we as producers recognized, and there was no expense that we're going to, going to stop from her having her private car, Adam as a driver, and then being with her for the next couple of hours, reading lines and preparing the next day. And I think Adam, that was, that was one of the big things that you had to do, right? So to, to talk about that a little bit more, maybe you guys can, can elaborate because on how it was sort of day to day for those 18 days plus it, what, do you have a day off every week? Is it six day weeks? Yeah. Up on the mountain, sort of taking care of Lena and, and Rosanna and the other actors and just creating that space for the directors to work with, with the actors. What was that like? Um, well, you know, Mike and I had, had talked and, um, you know, 
it really is true that we, you know, viewed her as she is a machine and, and, and talked about the instrument, the instrument of acting, and that I was totally cognizant of her as a concept and as a person, that this is a delicate instrument that needs to be taken care of. You know, and, and some people, and I would do anything to try to make people on the set understand that. And, and I called her lovingly, but I wanted them to understand this is not an actor on the set. You know, she's an Academy Award nominated actor. Um, you know, she comes from the tr what I've already mentioned. Uh, that, you know, and I said, the Tsarina likes her coffee this way. They don't understand why she wants something on a separate plate. It's not to be difficult. It's because what the instrument needs to perform. And so it was not anything about demanding because she's delivering. And it was incredibly moving and, uh, you know, that she had never done anything like this, ever. She missed her family terribly. She had uh, never worked on anything. This was just a project of love, and once we got her there, she was going to do it. She, had, she, you know, was talking to Lhasa, who, you know, if you don't know who that is, he did Cider House Rules in My Life as a Dog, and Oscar nominated himself. And she knew I was her ally, and, um, and that I would do anything to keep her going, and, uh, and that I would try to interact with the crew to try to give, deliver, you know, like one time they just said, we'll just put more food on their plate. Not yet, no, she needs a separate plate. She needs to feel like it's special, you know, because that's what the instrument needs. So, uh, Morgan, go ahead. Well, yeah, just quickly, I know we gotta keep moving and, and answer, you know, open to questions, but, uh, yeah, we had a, we were very fortunate to have a great crew on this. Uh, extremely talented DP uh, Pat Scola and his whole team of folks um, from all over the country. And again, uh, uh, the reason that we were able to get the caliber of people that we did for such a small budget was because the script was good. And I can't I can't like emphasize that enough. It's all about your script and your story. I mean, I just did a director uh, panel before this, and I just like. That's, that's really all that matters in this. I mean, it's not all that matters, but if you want to get into directing and be, I mean, that is your way in, to have a really, really good script that can be passed to people, and that'll convince a lot of people to do things they would never do uh, if it's really good, so. That's, that's great. Well, let, so I think we have about 15 more minutes, and I know there are going to be some questions from, from the audience, but let's, let's take a few minutes and talk about then the process of, of completing the film and, and you know I think especially interesting is that it's that you guys have got this film placed with a major distributor and um, it's it's going to have some some serious distribution associated with it. So so how did that work out? So as you know, costs started to go up and the, this budget started to go up uh, through housing mostly. It was housing issues uh, that uh, I had to try to find you know raise more money. And originally, we were going to try and do post-production, including in 230 or 250. And um, I went to, uh, I'm an EU citizen, and I'm in Europe a lot. And so I, when I was in Venice, I started to talk to other European producers about uh, Lena Olin, who is known in Europe. And so I started to try to build uh, ideas of raising money and doing post-production in Europe, and to try to make this a European film. And uh, we found a partner with a Polish uh, producer uh, who I know and who really likes me. And Magdalena Zizek, the other producer, has Polish heritage. And so we were able to, to uh, 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 use that. I was able to use that. The other writer-director, you mean? The other writer-director, yes. And so I was able to bring Poland in to partner. And I brought them in as an equity partner to pay for all the post-production. And they went to Poland to... This is gov Polish government? Well, we applied for Polish government money because it was so down to the wire. I needed also a backstop that if we didn't get approved, that the post-production house would pay for it and I would involve them as equity partners. And in the end, we didn't get Polish government to pay for it, uh, but the uh, post-production house paid for it and they're a partner, financial partner. And so they went, I got them an editor from Turkey who I knew uh, uh, and brought an editor from Turkey to Poland and they edited the film. Uh, they got it done, yes. and then I was able Crazy. to contact um, festivals and applied to Sundance and South By, and I really stressed to Janet at South By that this is a really strong female voice, 
This is a female character. I know what she wants, which is that she wants to see more strong female characters represented by women directors. And I made it clear to her that this was meeting her mandate. And she, and she said, you don't have to say anything. I've already gotten the reports from all the watch, people who watched it, and everybody's raving. So we were lucky to get into, and at the same time, I had Rotterdam and Berlin very interested. And we were, I was able to say to Janet, I would give, you, give her a world premiere uh, Janet in, Pearson, Janet Pearson uh, uh, at, at South By, if we got a narrative competition slot, that I would give up Berlin and Rotterdam as a world premiere. And so we were in narrative competition at South by Southwest as a world premiere, and that's like one of eight films, and then we were one of the, Amazon that year gave all narrative competition films a, a flat deal where everybody was offered, I think it was $125,000 uh, to, to, for SVOD three year. And we raised it up, and then eventually Goldwyn came in, and there was a little bit of a mini bidding war, and they paid for a little more of that. That's great. Congrat congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, amazing horse trading work there. Do you guys have anything you want to add before we open it up for questions? No, I want to hear what they have to ask and say. Sir. Hi there. Thanks for coming and sharing all of this with us. Um, I'm really curious when these two filmmakers, or actually they weren't filmmakers yet, when they first came to you, you didn't know who they were, or how, how did they, like that little variable is very interesting to me, like even for my future sort of like submissions and everything, like why did you even talk to them? Why did you take the meeting? What did they do? You didn't know them? Uh, you know, that's essentially, break down those details, yeah? Yeah, so like Magdalena, I knew because I had helped her, as she had been a producer who had, um, her, 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 she'd, produced a film called Redlands, which was a Western, a very arty Western that had played on the circuit. And I had helped her with that and helped her with just, she was somebody on the scene who had come to me through festivals. And then, you know, generally speaking, if somebody sends me a treatment and then they want to pick my brain, if it's connected to like a steak dinner, you know, in New York and I have to eat and they're going to pick up the bill, you know, I'll do it, you know, <laughs> and um, if it comes with a meal. And, um, you know, we talked and we had a lot in common and there, you know, there, we share a lot of aesthetics, uh, uh, concerns about films. Uh, we're both kind of European snobs, you know, we like European type films. We dislike most American indie film that's in commercial theaters. And um, so we shared a lot and they're big Bellatar fans. And so I knew that they were somebody that, you know, that I could work with. Yes. Come on up to the mic. Yeah. Thank you all for doing this and for bringing the film here. I've always wondered, um, for a small film, if, if it, the distribution explodes and a, a small film ends up making a lot of money, do you go back and give money to the actors and directors? And I've just always wondered about that. Yeah, so everything's built into the deal. The basic structure of all deals are the same, which is that we have a concept called MFN, which is Most Favored Nations. And so we try to build into the deal that everybody is getting paid the same equally crummy amount. Nobody's getting paid more than that crummy amount. And that everybody shares in what's called the waterfall, the back end profit. So there's a circle. After the investors make back 120%, which is 100% plus a 20% cap, there's a circle. And in that pie, it's split in half. Everything that's left over after 120%, half goes to the investor, and then half goes to points. And so actors get back end, the DP gets back end, the producer gets back end, the writer's director gets back end. So if there's ever a, a completely freaky, insane situation in which there's profit, um, that would get shared. That would the get unlikely shared. event. Yeah, the unlikely event. You know, and I just, I have to, I always tell people, you know, Junebug, which is one of the lowest budget films to get an Oscar nomination, you know, was made for $750,000. Um, it launched Amy Adams' career. 
and then we sold it to Sony Pictures Classics for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And I think on Box Office Mojo right now, the writer Angus McLaughlin has been here, and he was talking about it. It shows that the film has made thirteen million dollars and nobody has made any profit. Angus has not received any money. The investors never got any money. So when we're talking about a thievery of distributors, it's systemic to that business model. Capitalism is based on exploitation of labor, and it's based on exploitation of content. And unfortunately, it started with the music industry, and it goes through film. And so it's very difficult to see those points. But if it ever happened in some sort of weird situation, uh, it would be shared. Yeah, I think it's actually interesting. You know, you see a lot of uh, early indie film. There's all these historic things about, you know, El Mariachi being made for 7,000 and Clerks being made for 21 or whatever. Uh, but I, I was recently doing research in that because I did a workshop and I saw that um, Slacker was one of those uh, examples, uh, Richard Linklater's first film. And, uh, and that was like a $24,000 budget. But they actually, like, have now published a deferred budget. What it actually would have cost if they had paid the crew, and I think that's more accurate, because there is a lot of lies about these $20,000 movies, when it's, all that means is that people didn't get paid. It doesn't mean that's what it actually cost. To I mean, that's what the hard cost is, but that just, how, how many people did you exploit to get that done? So it's, it's a tricky, you know, situation, and I think it's smart to, to represent that deferred budget appropriately in those small models. It's a, yeah, it's a real problem in terms of getting, uh, clear, you know, to get it's so opaque, and um, um, yeah, like when Morgan was saying, you know, it gets bought at uh, where where was El Mariachi bought? But a lot of times, the person buying it, whether it was the whether it was Miramax back in the day, they'll put music. On, you know, it, it's not really you're not really seeing an eighty thousand dollar movie. Yeah, but yeah. They they have lots of ways to pay themselves in in the deal. Basically, there are a lot of expenses that are charged to the movies that actually go back to the distributors. So if you want to make money, the distribution business is really the side. Yeah, and on, and on, that, and on that note, you know, that the fact that the $750,000 investors of Junebug who have only received 250000 are not whole, the distributor would say that they spent all of that money on distribution expenses. So that's what they would say. That's actually why they're not sharing it. And how that happens, we know their history of chess records, we know that, and we certainly know Howlin' Wolf and, and it gives perspective on that. And that's a similar thing in film, unfortunately. Yeah, and go ahead and sue them and hire a forensic accountant and go through four years of litigation and you, and you may, uh, your net after you pay attorney's fees might be $10,000 if you win. Did you do that at some point? <laughs> <laughs> I've read about it. Any other? Um, so funny that you mentioned exploitation of labor because this is kind of a little segue into that. Um, I remember when doing Free Indeed that part of the constraints with the hours is that the main stars, Edwina Finley and uh, David Harewood, were card holders with SAG. So we couldn't work, we could only work a certain number of hours per day because of union stipulations. Um, did you, is that a big factor as well with other, either above the line or below the line uh, production staff for, you know, a $250,000 film? Yeah, I mean, the, the, these films are made under the contract of the Screen Actors Guild, and it's an amazing contract that the Screen Actors Guild has that's basically an allowed indie film to use people of superior talent to work at a very low rate. And there are basic rules that you have to follow. It means that they have to get 10 hours in their hotel or 12 hours in their hotel. They have to get a, a break room. They have to have their lunch. And we have to adhere to those. And it's a brilliant thing. They don't have it in Europe. And you know, everybody charged, they don't do what we do here in America because we have Screen Actors Guild. It enables filmmakers to use talent. At the same time, in terms of exploitation of labor, there are, all the crew is working for very little money under really bad conditions, and we're exploiting their labor at a, very, at a mere fraction of what they're worth. And to that extent, we have to respect the reality that we can't abuse them, and that we have to try to keep it to 12 hours at maximum, that they have break time. You know, I just did five and a half months in China making a film, and the exploitation of labor and the way they treated crew was uh, unbelievably shameful. And it made me think about the history of labor here in America. 
and that doesn't exist in China. And in America, we have that basic idea that we will exploit you for this amount of time, but it will end at, at one point. And if we agree to that before, then we're mutually exploiting each other to that degree. And so we try to find the morality in that, but you cannot be making independent films and running crazy 16 and 18 hour days. It just won't happen. And as a producer, you'll quickly be known as somebody who doesn't have control over a production. So we need to keep it to 10 to 12 hours. Although that, that does happen on, on features that are, that are done at a full budget because the crews get overtime and, and you know, so they start going into time and a half after 10 and then double time after 12 and so uh, people can live with that overtime, you know, for a little while. Other questions? Sure. <coughs> yes. Uh, I was wondering if would y'all ever consider uh, uh, associating with Warner Brothers, trying to make a film with Warner Brothers, even though they're a major motion motion picture studio. Warner, Warner Brothers. Yeah. Uh -huh. would, 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 talk, so maybe talk a little bit about sort of the relationship between indie films and movie studios, and kind of why. I mean, because that goes to the question of why indie films exist. Because basically, we're living in a world right now where the major motion picture studios have absolutely no economic interest in yes. making these kinds of films. And so for these stories to be told, people essentially have to do it as a labor of love and for the art yeah. of it. Maybe you guys can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, we're doing this for $250,000 not because Warner Brothers rejected it. We're making the film because there is no other way for anybody to see this film or make this film, and nobody ever would consider this on a financial level. There is no financial logic to this at all. It's completely driven by passion and artists. The investors who make independent film are artists. They are artists who are empowering, Megan, whether or not they're Megan Ellison or the guy who financed La La Land. They are people who are driven not just by finance. Warner Brothers is driven by finance. Those, the indie scene, is driven by passion for film. And passion does not exist in the corporate space. It does not exist in Warner Brothers. So we have to make them because we're driven by the utter illogic of making something that has no value in the marketplace, and that's passion. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Sir. Okay. Hello, my name is Shane. Um, yes, yeah, so I just graduated from film school. My thesis film played here. I'm from originally kind of from Memphis, and I'm glad Morgan brought up the idea of uh, deferred budgets because we talked about it in school. And I noticed there was no line for the director, so I'm guessing the, like director. We always talk about directors not getting paid. Uh, I'm sorry. Directors not. Okay, that's right. Sorry. Should I start over or? Okay, so my name is Shane. My film played here. Uh, I just graduated from film school, and we talked about budgets and all that type of stuff. And the idea of uh, deferred uh, budgets. And I was wondering if you guys did that, because we talked about how for the filmmakers, if they want to get a film funded later and they pitch and say, oh, we only spent 250000 but there are a lot of in-kind donations, like for the house and all that type of stuff. Have you guys done that so that in the future, if you guys want to work with these uh, filmmakers again, that they have that number? Like, it was, we say it was 250000 but actually it would have been 500000 if we paid for the house, if we paid for all these things that we got for free. Yeah, well, I was, in my experience, I mean, if you, if, once you're getting up to this level, you're, I mean, everyone is actually getting paid. You know, people weren't actually working for free. It's just enough money that you, it, it, it really, what is deferred then is, is the deals if it gets sold and makes more money. Well, I'm, I'm more referring to this micro budget model of like, what, you know, all, it was a huge thing in the 90s where all these films were being made for $7,000 or $20,000 and then getting this, you know, like clerks. You know, like it, it, it was, you know, so in that way that, uh, you know, Slacker was 25,000 but 120,000 deferred because that's what it would have cost, you know, and I think it's smart to do that and I have done that in certain situations like uh, making spec commercials, for example, like me and some friends got together and we just made these commercials and they're like, just in case we sell it, let's see what everyone would have gotten paid full commercial rate, let's put that down so when it actually budgets, so if it sells, people get their rate. And then they, that, it's just a straight rate, and then we're not arguing over, well, who gets a cut of 
the profit, whatever. It's like, no, you're, you're now getting your rate for what you would have, you know, your full rate for that day of work. And so I think it's smart to have someone create that budget so that's there in place. So there's just, it's sort of like a contract and there's not arguments later over percentages of what it might theoretically make down the line. And it's just very clean, you know, clear cut. So that's all, that's kind of what I mean by that. And, uh, and I think that once you get to $100,000, $200,000 uh, of a budget on a feature, everyone's going to be paid. So you don't have to worry about that deferred number in that. It's just more about contractually, if the film gets bought by cable, et cetera, there's already built in deals for who's getting splits of those. I just want to say in terms of the budget, you know, just quickly to end on this. You know, we have different definitions of what a micro budget is. A lot of people define micro budget as under 100,000. Um, the uh, reality is, is that, you know, Tiny Furniture, which my assistant Alicia produced, made by Lena Dunham, the budget was 50,000. It went on to win South by Southwest and then led to the TV show called Girls. Old Joy, which Kelly Reichard made, which I was one of the producers on, the budget was $50,000. It won Best Film at Rotterdam and launched, you know, kind of the career that we now know of Kelly Reichard. So if the script is written well and it's a strong story, you can make an amazing film right now for $50,000. It's really not a problem. So that's, that's your mission. Thank you, Mike, Adam, Morgan. Awesome, thank you so much.